Our second session today is going to focus on modernizing our newborn screening system, scaling for sustainability. So again, that scaling for sustainability really gets to the core of some of the work we've done in this space and sharing the fact that to steal Dr. Prosser's idea of not getting too excited about this giant new toy. Uh, there's some really interesting ideas out there uh, and we love a lot of them and we support many of them, but also ensuring the fact that these policy ideas will fit into the work system that currently exists and we can help grow it as opposed to create additional challenges. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today in terms of our recent work in this space uh, and then I'm going to bring up two fantastic panelists later uh, and we'll get into a conversation and again I, I really encourage uh, please ask as many questions as you would like. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about kind of the current challenges, so we would love to hear about some of your experiences there, as well as some questions about potential solutions. That's who I am. Um, so the opening slide is the title of our most recent newborn screening modernization white paper. And so today I'm going to present a little bit of around this idea, but again, focusing more on kind of how we got there and the education behind this, as opposed to the individual policy ideas. Uh, again, we are a policy and privacy organization. I'll give a policy update after lunch. Uh, and if you have any questions on the next steps in terms of policy, I'm happy to answer those. I'm here the entire day. I'm here at the reception. My email is always available. Uh, but today is going to focus a little bit more on the areas we're addressing as opposed to the solutions themselves. And so I want to take a step back in terms of kind of why we decided to do this project. And so we're all well, well aware of the challenges within newborn screening, the limited federal evidence reviews, challenges with implementing new screening methods, limited state and federal funding. And the, the stat on the right came from a paper from RTI uh, in 2021 uh, that surveyed various newborn screening experts. And 100% of the newborn of those experts said that small or large change was needed uh, within the newborn screening system. And within that 100%, 45% said large change was needed. And the reason I, I like using the stat is first, very rare you're gonna get anybody in any survey to say 100%. So 100% say we need something. Um, and so it really highlights the fact that we know we need to make these changes. We cannot let the status quo continue. We need to make updates. And so today I wanna to talk a little bit about like what, where those updates could occur. And so we brought together a planning committee um, of which a few of those members are in the room today, so I always like to thank them. Uh, they were fantastic partners in this in helping to plan uh, what those roundtables would look like, as well as identifying experts, what questions, how we want to push the conversation forward. Uh, and so it was really a group effort uh, from the organizations you can see on the um, right or right hand of the screen. But on the left side, you can see it's really this idea of what went into the roundtables themselves. So we held three roundtables. The first of which was a public event in which we want to ensure the fact that we're hearing from everybody in terms of what are some of the solutions you think we need to be talking about for newborn screening. And so that event we had over 100 uh, newborn screening stakeholders attend, but for the final two, we, we wanted to make sure that we were having in depth conversations, and so we ensured that we invited stakeholders from across the newborn screening community and really ensure the fact that we can dig deep into some of these ideas and so we invited stakeholders from patient advocacy organizations, industry, state lab directors, academic researchers, physicians, to really make sure the fact that when we're talking about pr proposed solutions, that we had a real understanding of, could this work? Uh, and I think one of the most interesting examples of that was within, we talked a little bit around uh, newborn screening sequencing um, in the last panel, and that came up quite frequently uh, in the roundtables, and there was a state lab director who said, I really love the idea of conducting more newborn sequencing, She's like, but we just don't have the capability in our lab. And so understanding the fact that we need to be talking about these, not in a vacuum, that we have to have a true understanding of what is possible. And so here are the four key themes for modernization. And so today I'm gonna to walk through each theme uh, and as opposed to going through in depth the policies, the, the white paper we used, we, we wrote included real world examples. So we wanted to highlight Here's how we know some of these ideas could actually work in the world. Um, and so for the first, uh, some of the, the key to the theme was how do we increase federal leadership, accountability, and transparency within federal newborn screening programs. And so some of the solutions discussed there were around the federal role within newborn screening, as well as the role of ACHDNC and the standards during the evidence review. But when looking in terms of a real world example, we came across the One Health program. So, 
It's 100 percent outside the newborn screening space, uh, but for me that's actually really exciting because we know that it works because we have seen it work in a different space. Uh, and so it served as a collaborative approach to address uh, zoonotic diseases that could impact national health. And it contained over 20 different federal agencies. So while I was led out of the CDC and include the Department of Agriculture and Interior, during the uh, COVID-19, early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, this program was able to work together to really partner how to address how COVID-19 impacted their work. And so again, in the early days of COVID-19, there was a lot of conversations around how is this going to impact animals? Will the virus be able to jump from humans to animals back to humans? And so what the One Health program was able to do was create a series of guidances and best practices around how to approach this and potential issues. And it was a collaboration of over 20, 20 federal agencies, which is more than work within the newborn screening space. Um, but it was led out of a single agency at a CDC with some additional partners. And it really highlights the ability of bringing the entire federal programs together can be led out of a single agency as long as we're aware of who is taking that lead. And so it was a really interesting example of how do we increase federal accountability and transparency in the space while ensuring the fact that we want these federal agencies to work together. So next we were looking at the regional lab network. And so within newborn screening, we'll talk more about this with our panel when they come up. Uh, regional labs have been a common proposed solution in recent years in terms of how to improve state implementation. And so one of the key themes was kind of moving past that question of are regional labs the best option and moving on to how do we properly establish this, recognizing that there will need to be a federal role uh, in making that establishment that you cannot have states working together to figure out what works best for maybe there are three states, you need a 50 state plan to figure out, okay, how is the New England region going to work with the mid Atlantic versus the plain states and understanding you need to ensure that a regional lab network. Uh, will need to be have input from multiple stakeholders and really need a federal partner taking the lead on that process. And so, in terms of the real world example, uh, we didn't have to look too far uh, within New, New England, they do essentially this already or a form of this already. Uh, the New England Newborn Screening Program screens about 500 newborns every day uh, within Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. I uh, always like to highlight that Connecticut is the lone New England state that does their own screening. Um, and each individual state's public health department determines which conditions are screened. And so each state does still have uh, decisions to make about their own program. Uh, and so when we say there are each state has each newborn screening is an individual unique program to, to that state. This still rings true within New England. So just because Massachusetts screened for one condition, it's not going to, going to force Vermont to do it. Uh, but what this allows to do is allows for new states outside of Massachusetts within New England to focus on other issues within their state and recognize, okay, here's what I need to make newborn screening work in my state because I know Massachusetts uh, Public Health Lab can take care of the screening. So the third theme was looking at population level data. I'm actually going to move much faster through this slide because Carla actually did a fantastic presentation around Eden. Um, we held the roundtables in the summer of 2022, um, and since then Eden has started to really come into the world and really show some of the great work that it has that's possible when we start talking about this idea of data sharing. But I guess the idea that a really key theme is how do we better share population accessible data because we need to ensure the fact that. This data isn't being hidden uh, and that everyone has access to it, uh, not only the states, but patient advocacy organizations, and that you're sharing best practices on how to implement these conditions. Because at the end of the day, we know that it's working and we know that if we have all that data and can pull more of that data together, we can identify those best, best practices and really ensure the fact that newborn screening as a whole uh, is succeeding across the country. And so the last thing we looked at uh, was how to integrate next gen uh, evidence based neonatal sequencing into the newborn screening program. And so there's an understanding that sequencing can play such an important role within newborn screening. Uh, and we know that it's already involved in certain places, and we'll talk more about that with the panel. But when we're talking about the idea of growing the role of newborn screening, we need of newborn sequencing, understanding the fact that we cannot just drop in uh, this new cool technology without having larger questions of how does it fit within the newborn screening program. You're, if you're going to do whole genome sequencing in a mandatory program, what does storage look like around that? What does what are the ethical questions around that? Uh, then just from a logistics perspective, uh, are the state labs able to do that? Or if we are doing a regional lab network, how is best sharing all that information? 
so that you can see within the proposed solutions was really the idea of a coordinated national study to determine how best to integrate newborn screening, uh, accepting the fact that this is something that could definitely benefit newborn screening. But if we're not taking the time to ask the how, we, we're at risk for implementing a new technology that's going to fracture the system because it's not ready for it. Uh, and in terms of real world examples, um, the BabySeq project was the first clinical trial to employ genome sequencing uh, of healthy newborns during routine newborn screening. Uh, and this was a really interesting project. It was smaller numbers, uh, but has produced a lot of publications that really looked at a variety of issues within newborn screening. And so again, we, we know that this can work. We know on a smaller scale, BabySeq really looked at not only the benefits of neonatal sequencing, uh, but some of the challenges around implementation, some of the looking at the impacts on families and how they view newborn screening when sequencing instead of the screen itself. Uh, and so really increases our understanding of that. And so again, it goes back to the idea of having a better understanding of, we know this can work done on a small scale. So let's see what we can do to make it work on a larger scale. Always wanna address the limitations of our study. Um, so it did not address inequities within the follow-up services, it did not address workforce challenges, as well as did not address difficulty in setting up pilot studies. Those are all aspects that are core to the newborn screening system um, and are important and need to be addressed. Uh, but we had to set some guardrails within the roundtables. If we had said, uh, let's address all issues, all challenges within the newborn screening system, our three-day uh, roundtable would have turned into about three-month roundtable. So we need to set some, some guardrails, but we want to acknowledge the fact that we know there are a lot of challenges that were not necessarily addressed within the, within the paper itself that need to be addressed within the newborn screening system. In addition, limited to 45 participants, uh, that was purposeful in terms of helping to ensure the fact that we were getting some real in-depth conversations. Uh, and it was, it served, it resulted in having those conversations that we desired, but at the same time, you're only talking to 45 people that have to be acknowledged. Uh, and lastly, we did not discuss funding solutions within newborn screening. Uh, we know funding is a challenge, you know, resources are a challenge. Uh, I do not want to pretend that we're being oblivious to that. Um, however, a panelist who's going to join us, Natasha Bonome, often says funding for newborn screening is at the highest it's ever been, and we still have the current challenges we have today. And so while we need to address funding challenges, and we 100% need to fund, uh, address those resource issues, but we also need to address the issues around that as well, and understanding the fact that as we start to identify those funding solutions, that the money is going to a system that has addressed the larger policy based solutions uh, policy challenges and can really start to use that money to grow newborn screening. Uh, so, in conclusion, I always like to use this graph on the side uh, that really shows where we've been in the last 20 years uh, and so 20 years ago there was the first published full human genome uh, and then five years after that is when we saw the first newborn screening saves lives act pass year after that is when we saw the first. Uh, cell or gene therapy received FDA approval. Um, however, we have not seen a reauthorization of the newborn screen saves lives act since 2014. And so is taking this first of a kind study and saying, okay, we, we need another moment where we're going to push the program forward. Uh, and if we're going to do that properly, we need to ensure the fact that we're using a multifaceted approach such as this, ensuring the fact that we're including all stakeholders um, to improve the entire system. Uh, and so with that, uh, I want to make sure to take a moment to acknowledge everybody who was a part of this. Uh, a few of them are in this room today, and I want to take a moment to thank uh, Natasha Bonome, Kate Donegan, as well as Amy Brower, who are all on the planning committee, uh, and thank you so much for your efforts. Um, and with that, I will move on to our panel. Um, actually, one more time. Yeah, when we move to the panel, we will have a Q&A session, so if you have any questions about uh, the presentation, I'm happy to answer them then. But I want to make sure to bring up our, our panelists and notes. Um, before I go into the official uh, introduction uh, for both our panelists, on a personal note, as I said, both these members were on our planning committee, uh, and in addition, uh, as I've been at the Everlife Foundation for four years, learning about newborn screening for four years, uh, these two have generally been two of the people I am quickest to go ask a question about newborn screening. They are some of the best minds of the newborn screening, uh, and it's really a pleasure to work with them quite frequently. So uh, first, we will, I will introduce Natasha Bonome. Uh, who is the Chief Strategy Officer and Founder of Expecting Health. We won't move that. Um, with more than 15 years of nonprofit uh, experience uh, as a founder of Expecting Health, uh, Natasha has focused on centering families' perspective, perspectives into policy and program design and implementation. Um, 
Natasha has created and overseen the creation of Baby's First Test, which is a national resource center, uh, and currently serves as an organizational representative on the ACHDNC. Uh, in addition, we will have Dr. Amy Brower joining us. Uh, Dr. Brower received her PhD in 2001 and helped to contribute uh, to the initial publication of th uh, three chromosomes, a part of the Human Genome Project. In 2003, Dr. Brower was appointed to the inaugural ACHDNC, which led to her current position uh, at ACMG. Uh, Dr. Brower currently serves as the director of MBSTRN, uh, with MBSTRN leading the work to serve as a research hub for innovation and impactful efforts across the newborn screening system. And so with that, if Natasha and Amy could join me on stage. Thank you so much. I'm still thinking about your 20 year slide. Where was I 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Working on the Human Genome Project. Yeah. We were here. yeah. <laughs> we were at the Bethesda North. Right. I think we were. This carpet reminds yeah. me. So, the first question I want to talk about is a little bit of terms of kind of your perspective on the white papers itself. So, what were areas addressed in the white paper that you believe would benefit from an increase in education about how that space operates? Um, you know, I think the part about sequencing was really interesting that it came up and the fact that um, we're at a time where I think people's perspectives on sequencing in the newborn period is rapidly changing and evolving. Um, and so I think it'll be a real interesting historical, not to say past dated, but just like a historical marker in terms of states really thinking about what does it mean from their laboratory perspective, but then what do all of us as a society think in terms of, wow, generating all of this data on not just an individual, but on a family? And where do the dots connect to better healthcare outcomes? And so I think there's a lot more to be done in that space. And that's not just a newborn screening question. That is really a question around genomics, advocacy. You know, it's, it's much bigger. But I really thought that that was, that was one of the things I was kind of surprised that that came up and that people were so open to discuss it. And I think that actually is a, was a sign of how open people were in the roundtables to really say and to take the question very seriously, where do we need to go? Um, not just what have we done well, but really, what are we working towards and what do we need to get ready, ready for? Um, and so to have uh, the public health laboratory representatives bring that up, I think really showed, like I said, the openness in the conversation, but that there's just a lot more education that needs to happen in terms of what are we really talking about here when we say sequencing? Like what does that even mean? Um, and where are we today and where, where do we wanna go with that? And I agree with you, Natasha. I think each of the four themes for me really have a lot of education that's needed around them, even understanding that we already have successful regionalization. Oregon screens for a handful of states, Massachusetts screens for a handful of states, Iowa screens for North Dakota and South Dakota, and the list keeps growing. And we tried out a regionalization model in 2010 um, when SCIB was nominated. Um, so we did um, that model during the pilot. So I think just even educating ourselves on what are the best practices in states, what have states already figured out, and how do we um, understand what the states have done as well as with sort of neonatal sequencing, you know, um, families with newborn screening, they want news you can use, as Dr. Wendy Chung says. So they want to know, am I positive? Am I negative? What does that mean for the next steps? What do I need to do for my baby and my family? And sequencing can help us reduce false positives. It can help tell us more about diseases. Some of the conditions that are part of routine screening now, you need to know the sequence to be able to choose the therapy. And that sequence can guide um, monitoring over the long term for comorbidities. Um, I think in the introduction, um, such a long history as 20 years ago, I was thinking about 
not just the genome project, but my first son, Joey, who was born with severe combined immune deficiency. So he's 31 now, can you imagine? Um, but also thinking about, you know, our um, sort of journey as parent and professional, um, you know, being on the advisory committee, the first round, I didn't even tell him I had a child with, um, you know, SCID, because I didn't know SCID was part of the newborn screening community. I was appointed for my genomics expertise. so. Um, life is kind of strange how it teaches you all these wonderful things. Um, but I think the modernization study again just showed us a lot of work for Natasha's group and for every life to help educate us about those four themes and sort of what's already out there. And I think that's what we heard in a lot of the roundtables is there's a lot of things that states and stakeholders have figured out. We just don't understand what they all are. So we're three minutes in, I'm already asking a personal curiosity question. Oh. Um, <laughs> Amy, if you could go a little bit into depth in terms of the 2010, the SCID regional, regional lab network approach. So I'm curious kind of yeah. how you guys went about that. What were some of the successes or some mm -hmm. of the learnings that came out of that? You know, it really came out of um, the advisory committee. So, you know, um, when the advisory committee first started, I was um, an inaugural member and we sort of worked on the evidence review, but at every meeting was to immunologists, Rebecca Buckley and Jennifer Puck, who Dr. Erb mentioned earlier was head of the PIDTC, one of the rare disease networks. Um, they came to every single meeting and said SCID's a pediatric emergency. And so when SCID was nominated, the first condition to be nominated, we knew that to be part of newborn screening, we needed high throughput states and low throughput states. And so we did it in California and New York and Wisconsin and um, Massachusetts did regionalization to Louisiana and Puerto Rico. And that was driven by the wonderful partnership between CDC and NIH at the time in planning that um, pilot. It was actually combined funds from NICHD and CDC working together. And we were sort of thinking about how do we do this? Um, and so I think the regionalization really worked because we were able to, it would have taken Louisiana a long time and Puerto Rico to come up with a molecular approach to um, the skid assay, but by shipping the samples to Wisconsin and Massachusetts, we could show that, you know, we can get the results quickly um, and, you know, act on the parents' behalf. So I think it was one of the first times regionalization has been included in a pilot. Definitely agree. I have somebody who has watched more and more of the ACHDNC. It's not something that you, you see quite often, so it's an interesting perspective. Um, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, I want to touch a little bit back on Natasha's point that both of you made uh, in terms of genetic sequencing uh, and the role of newborn screening. I feel like quite often it's a hot topic with the newborn screening. What is its role? How can we move forward? Uh, but before we do that, I kind of want to take a step back and kind of do a level set. So I'm curious if both of you or if one of you want to take this question in terms of what is the role currently of genetic testing within newborn screenings? I know it is plays a current role, and I feel like too often we skip that step. So if we can do a little background in terms of kind of where it is currently. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to take that one. So it's really evolving and changing, but right now sequencing um, is used mostly on the second tier or third tier even in newborn screening where we're trying to figure out what was that screen positive. And there's particular conditions that are part of routine newborn screening, cystic fibrosis, the LSDs, hearing loss, SCID, where you need to have sequencing of targeted genes to understand you know, what to do next, how to care for the child, how to inform the family, how to inform cascade testing, um, which means testing other family members who might be at risk. And so we're really using it as a second tier, but What's exciting is there's research studies um, that are using it, beginning to use it as a first year. And again, we can look around the world for examples. So um, just in September, China published the first um, targeted neonatal sequencing of a panel, 30,000 newborns, and they found one in 500 newborns benefited from the sequencing result. That's amazing. Um, I think the studies that we cited earlier, like BabySeq, NC Nexus, all the wonderful Insight programs, they really had um, small numbers. So 159, you know, 280 in each of those cohorts. Now we're going 30 times that size to China and looking at 30,000 newborns and saying, we've impacted one in 500 newborns. Translate that to the United States and boy, 
if we were able to sequence every newborn and put those variants in a database, we would have our brand new reference sequence to look at. That's one of the challenges today of interpreting genomic sequences. We don't have a diverse set of genomes to help us interpret those results. So I get pretty passionate when I get to think back about the ACGTs that we studied um, you know, over 20 years ago and how they could really impact the lives of patients and families. But you know, being as in a skid family, you know, I'm on the skid groups on Facebook. And the first thing after they get that positive track is what's my sequence? What's my gene? What's been your experience? What do I need to do? Do I need to isolate? Do I need to, you know, what what happens next? So I think newborn screening programs are primed, um, you know, the leading ones who are able to adopt new technologies to use that second tier neonatal sequencing. But I think one of the benefits of having sequencing in public health is that all newborns will get the benefit of sequencing. If we try to do the sequencing at the diagnostic level, which we do, I'm a medical geneticist, so that's what we do today, you know, we're going to run into state policies where maybe Medicare or Medicaid won't cover it, third party insurances won't cover it, so then we'll quickly see you know, uh, health inequities and a disparity. So I'm a big, I'm totally in uh, favor of sequencing being in the public health arena. I think we just have to give support, you know, to Dr. Cuthbert and to the other programs to help them, you know, implement it and then to understand on the other side, um, you know, what do these variants mean? Um, so we either look at whole exomes, which is just 1% of the genome, or we can look at the whole genome, which means we have 5 million changes to kind of think through. Um, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I think it's, you know, a really exciting time. Yeah, um, that's why you have the medical geneticist speak first. <laughs> um, you know, what I will add to that is um, just kind of some food for thought is we have so much that we're learning when it comes to sequencing. And we have a number of different programs happening both in the in the US and internationally. Um, but we also have um, what many are calling a turn on public health happening, particularly in our society. And so our public health partners who are excited to learn and to really figure this out and to see, okay, how do we make sure new technology actually does benefit every child um, that it can, are also really grappling with you know, public health being under attack right now. And so, right, so what uh, that is quite the friction in terms of, you know, sometimes you may feel like you have to, you know, keep your head down and just keep going forward, but you also wanna be transparent and open and make sure communities are involved. Um, and, and layer on top of that, both the excitement around the idea of sequencing during the newborn period and possibly as part of newborn screening and also, you know, we are now, you know, however many years out from um, the Human Genome Project. And so you have a lot of people who are kind of like, I thought we were supposed to have it all fixed by now, right? Like we did, we did the whole thing. It was a big deal. Like where are the daily pills that I just get, you know, airdropped to me based off of my, uh, you know, genetic code that will keep me living forever, right? So we have all these conflicting um, perspectives and issues at play that all are actually in the mix, even though oftentimes you may talk sometimes in a siloed way about the technology or about the laboratory or about the program, you know, all of these things are coming together um, in at this time when there really is this excitement and in, and investment in how do we actually take that knowledge around sequencing implement it for the better, what will that actually look like. And just to add on this idea that I know in this room always here a newborn screening is a system, not a test. And this idea of when we're looking at some of these new cool innovative uh, screening options that we're not losing sight of that that we're understanding the fact that it has to fit into these our entire system as a whole so that's going to include not only the science side of false positive false negative rates does the screen actually identify what we needed to um but with newborn screen is a mandatory program how does it fit into that what is the follow-up and education how's that going to change within genetic testing so i think those are all really interesting ways to to talk about it. I think the genetic sequencing, it's a very intriguing time within newborn screening uh, and really kind of, I feel like to Natasha's point, it feels like a per it's an interesting time because it's at a pivot point with that 
kind of turn on public health, but I feel like we're also kind of at a pivot point within newborn sequencing where you're starting to see a lot more conversations around this uh, and kind of what that looks like. So I think it's kind of interesting that they're coming together and what does more data along with more skepticism actually look like when they interact with each other. Um, I also make, make sure I make a point. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. We have a couple of uh, volunteers who are gonna help run some mics. Uh, so again, please don't hesitate to raise your hands uh, and ask any questions. Uh, but with that, I have more of my own questions. So we have talked a lot around um, within the newborn screening space around the ACHD and the federal review process and kind of what that looks like and change we want to make moving forward. Uh, but similar to my last question, I kind of want to take a step back and acknowledge the fact that the original list was produced by ACMG. Uh, the, the first 29 conditions on the Rust came from an ACMG recommendation. And so I want to ask a question for both of you who, who have kind of seen that transition. Um, can you speak to how and why there's a transition from the previous model of ACMG making the recommendation to the current model of the ACHDNC and the Rust? Uh, and how has the increased federal accountability of that list benefited the process? So I just want to jump in in case Michelle Perrier is watching oh. that it was an ACMG and HRSA um, collaboration. I was right? say that. I know Thank you're you going to say that. I know, <laughs> but I just wanted to you know, and that, um, and just to say that. But it really was that kind of a collaboration yeah. that brought a number of different uh, specialty groups together. So yeah, and like Natasha reminds me, and Dylan, you know, it was really advocates that causes to happen because in 1999 there was an AAP task force on newborn screening and there had been a few publications in leading newspapers about border babies so you know if you live you know in my tri-state area of Iowa Nebraska South Dakota you know which hospital you choose that's what panel you get and so there were some key stories of misdiagnoses or late diagnoses where the family didn't have the opportunity to benefit from newborn screening. So that led AAP to form a task force. The task force looked across the United States. There were no guidelines before then at all. States decided state by state what they could screen for, what their panels would look like. You know, they were informed, um, but you know, there was differences across all the 59 programs that Dr. Brasco mentioned earlier. So AAP um, said, hey, we think there should be a study done. And Dr. Perrier took it on at HRSA as the branch chief at the time. And she actually commissioned ACMG to lead this effort. So it was a HRSA originated and funded activity. ACMG led the way um, to bring experts together and come up with an evidence review process or the first 1.0 evidence review process to say, do we understand the condition? Do we have a test and a screening test? And do we have a treatment? So there were sort of three big areas that led into at the same time the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act being passed and then the formation of the Federal Advisory Committee. So the first thing the advisory committee took on was a review of ACMG's approach. And we knew that, you know, trying to standardize or inform the state programs on what they could include in their panels was job one. So it is called newborn screening. It is a system, as I was taught from my first um, you know, hours on the um, advisory committee, they said it's a system of prenatal screening, short-term and long-term follow-up. Um, and you know that was sort of taught to me early on. So I think early on the first job of the advisory committee, we spent three years after we made a charter thinking about this evidence approach because we knew that the panels would just keep growing, that we would learn more about technology, more about ways to screen and diagnose, and more about ways to treat and ensure that all newborns had the best possible outcome um, that we could give to them. So I think, you know, um, when the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act got um, written, it empowered the advisory committee to do this evidence review. So it goes back to the important role legislation pay, plays in telling each of our federal partners, you know, sort of what their job ones are. And for the advisory committee, it was coming up with and make, trying to maintain, um, you know, inform the states on what they could include in a newborn screening panel. And I think, Dylan, it's such a great question because, you know, one of the themes that um, through the roundtable people brought up was that idea of federal accountability, because I think we all just think, you know, if it's on the panel, 
babies are going to be saved and everything is going to be okay. But again, that's just the first step. But I think it's been great to have some federal accountability. ACMG still on sort of the genetics genomic side, you know, publishes which variant should you return. If you're sequencing an 18 month old or an 18 year old, which of the variants in the genome tell us something about you know, how to impact that child and family's health. So outside of newborn screening, we're continuing to publish um, sort of guidance on how to interpret the genome. Um, but I think for newborn screening, this is a big area that the advisory committee um, will continue to play a huge role in. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, thinking about what is happening today, you know, we talked about these research projects that are taking place looking at sequencing, they each have their own gene list, right? So there's also in another area, people, experts, rare disease experts coming together and determining what they think their list is. Now, those lists are much longer, anywhere from 200 to 400 different diseases that um, can have a pediatric, you know, an impact during the pediatric time period. So I think it's important for us to, when we're thinking about what does this mean for newborns, to also think, to really think what does that all mean, right? What does that mean for newborn screening? What does that mean for it at a federal level? What are states thinking about? But then also what else is happening in this environment that is focused on early detection of rare diseases? So I wonder when those will come together, um, because again, it isn't only the advisory committee that's looking at these questions. And other sometimes it's a lot of the same experts, of course. So how do we make sure there's that uh, transfer of, of knowledge and information? Um, I think another piece in this is since that time with the commissioned report, we really have evolved in terms of the idea of what does benefit mean for families. And so I'm really looking forward to when that is really folded in even more on all these levels. Um, I know that tomorrow there at the advisory committee meeting, there will be uh, listening sessions. I don't know much about them, but I know there's one, um, uh, at least one that I think this topic will be a part of um, that, I, you know, if you're able to join that meeting, I would really encourage you all to um, share your perspectives on that. Because again, this it, it, we keep saying it's a system, it's not just a test, and it doesn't just impact that infant, it impacts the whole family. And so how do we make sure we're bringing that um, into the dialogue as well. I see a question. This question is from Brooke Crook in the chat. And um, she says, how do you think genetic counselors or other providers familiar with genetic testing may be able to help as sequencing and newborn screening becomes more mainstream? For example, education in the primary care setting or playing more of a role in primary care settings? Question mark. It's a really good question. I'll start. Uh, you know, there absolutely is a role for genetic counselors and those who are trained in giving education um, at that period. I think one of the challenges is that, um, you know, you if you go to any genetics meeting, there's always many, many sessions on workflow and, and not just workflow, but workforce. And, you know, there aren't enough genetic counselors, there aren't enough geneticists, there aren't, you know, it feels like there aren't enough any anybody, any things, right? Um, that being said, I do think that we really need to see how can we take that expertise and see where are the opportunities where it really is best to speak one-on-one -on -one with someone and where is it best where you have the information and have you know use the all the amazing technology that we have um, in current day right so whether that is chatbots there's a lot of chatbot uh, uh, me and Mariana just recently were at the national conference of um, uh, the National Society of Genetic Counselors their annual conference and there was a lot about AI and chatbots and you know how do we use this technology how do we make sure the information is good so that's very exciting but also you can't just let it happen by magic, right? We have to make sure that from the beginning and the design that we have those that expertise there. Um, so I, I do think there are a lot of opportunities. 
Now, when we start to talk about that within the context of public health, I think that becomes a bit more challenging. Um, again, public health also has really big issues when it comes to um, workforce. Uh, you know, the pay is not great and the hours are long and, you know, a lot of times you can't fully voice what you want to say. Sign up now, right? I mean, it's really <laughs> challenging. It's, it's amazing the work that our public health partners do, but we also have to see, okay, if this should be embedded, right, genetic counselors or even just more um, genetics expertise embedded in our newborn screening programs, we have to make that make sense for that person, for that individual from a professional perspective, but also a personal perspective. You know, I think about the stories of amazing public health workers who, you know, there's one in particular who says he's retired. Yeah, I think he works more now than he did before, including going to driving to different states to help them in their labs. That's amazing. It is not sustainable. And so as we move forward quickly in lots of other arenas, how do we make sure that the systems at play are actually um, keeping up? Um, and again, that also includes education and communication for families and providers. And for me, genetic counselors are sort of the unsung heroes of newborn screening. Every big research study I've been part of, whether it's a pilot or a natural history, genetic counselors have led it. You know, we just finished a two year pilot in Duchenne, thanks to Parent Project for Muscular Dystrophy and all Annie's efforts, you know, over a decade ago. And the leaders of the data entry, the study design were genetic counselors. Um, so genetic counselors play such an important role to on all three sort of, we think of newborn screening with three legs, CDC, HRSA, and NIH, and now NCATS and NICHD. So I think about that. Um, so my stool is getting bigger and it can be shiny and it's an object. So I like that. Um, but just saying that, you know, we need more of them. But one of the things we've been fortunate at ACMG to also think a lot about long term follow up. So through the NICHD funding and HRSA funding that we have, we've been thinking about parent informed outcomes. So I love when Dr. Brasco says, and I forget how he says it, if they can grow and go to school and play and you know um, grow up that that's our goal. Well, until we measure long-term follow-up outcomes, we don't know how we're doing in newborn screening. Um, you know, 50%, as Dr. Brasco said, of sickle cell, you know, don't get the re, uh, recommended treatment. Um, we need to look at that across all conditions and really start to do a level set. So I almost think in the modernization roundtables, long term follow up and being able to diagnose timely, you know, every life has some other efforts about the importance of timely diagnosis and care and intervention. The majority of conditions that are part of newborn screening are not curable, they're treatable. Many of them have comorbidities on the skid. At least 50% of the families have neurodevelopmental delays throughout the child's lifetime. They all need care. Yes, they survive their immune deficiency, but they have other challenges. And we can list that across all of the conditions that are part of newborn screening. So I see genetic counselors playing a role not only in the beginnings of newborn screening, but throughout the lifespan as families and individuals are dealing with a brand new comorbidity or a brand new symptom or a brand new outcome, you know, that they weren't dealing with. And, you know, Terry, we were talking a little bit earlier about your program, sort of the lifespan program. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I think that was really instructive. Is that okay if I... Of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amy, for that. Um, the Society serendipitously had began a program in 2016, which really launched in 17 called Pathways. And it was an opportunity for us to bring social workers, ourselves that we have hired underneath the umbrella of the National MPS Society to meet with families at the time of diagnosis and meet face to face. And little did we know, we knew the importance of it, we just didn't know where it was going to take us and where it was going to take those families. And so at this point now that we're in 2023, we've seen over 400 families face to face and it has absolutely been life changing for them. But it's also been able for us to take a step back on the board to look at what's really important in terms of where are they five years later? 
how have they been able to navigate the healthcare system and the potential movement towards a therapy, or if they didn't have a therapy, how were their long-term management care handled with the specialty clinics? And this is something that we weren't necessarily expecting to know. We were glad that we've captured this information, um, but as we can see, as time has evolved in terms of newborn screening, how valuable these pieces of information are. And we don't know of another organization that's doing this. Now with MPS2 being added, it's important. But I think maybe one more thing I'll share, um, Dr. Brower, is that what we're seeing also today is not just through the newborn screening, but because of genetic testing and how incredibly accessible it is with specialty clinics, we're now seeing what we say is the attenuated forms of the MPS disorders or the ML disorders, where they're being picked up at specialty clinics through ophthalmology because of RP issues or possibly through respiratory clinics, ENTs. And we now have a, a new subset of patients that are coming into our, into our fold at the National MPS Society that are over 25 or 30 years old that would have never been picked up unless they were with a specialty physician. So this is really changing a lot for us. Thank you. Stephanie, you have a question for me. <clears throat> so the initial list of 29 conditions that was uh, arrived at was not signed off on by the he Secretary of Health and Human Services until 2010. And in 2023, we've added eight. And that seems very slow to me, having been involved in one of those nominations and knowing about the MPS one nomination. I'm Matthew Ellenwood. I'm from the National <laughs> MPS Society. Sorry about that. I should have introduced myself first thing. Is it time for Rust to be taken away from ACHDNC? And is it time for us to think about a 2.0 with uh, ACM, uh, American College of Medical Genetics? Uh, it, will that be a more efficient and appropriate way to get us uh, to equity for these diseases. And I say that because, uh, 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 Duchenne aside, our diseases that are going to be candidates are increasingly less common in terms of birth incidents. And the, the difficulty of getting those a pilot program in a state, whether that's a, research, a consented or an unconsented pilot, that's almost unsurmountable. I provide the example of MPS6. We've had a therapy since 2005. No state is currently screening for MPS-6. And I think the prejudice is it's considered ultra rare, one in 250,000. What state is going to do that? If we had a different approach to RUSP, it would get listed. And, it, and the RUSP is very clear. Every time something gets added, the feds acknowledge this is not a mandate this is not mandatory it's recommended why don't we have a more progressive approach towards recommendations i can take that um <laughs> for the mandate part um i guess it was a complicated federal state relation so uh, and i know you know well, i'm not saying we oh should, uh, no okay it, uh, the rust is very clear that it's a mandate and it will always be a mandate and by no means was i expecting that we should take away the mandate my point was it's a mandate it's not going to hamstring states uh is there a reason that we are not more progressive so the states that have the resources and the bandwidth and the desire add it using RUSP as a support, so to speak. So that's one of my reasons to think about, do we liberalize how RUSP uh, uh, listing happens? It will all, I don't see a way out of the mandate issue. So you're lovingly pulling us into the policy and advocacy side. Um, <laughs> but what I will say, to try to not get too far into the, the political side of it, is the timeline I showed on my final slide was purposeful. Uh, where we've been in the last 20 years has changed a lot. Um, in 2008, when the original Newborn Screen Saves Lives Act was passed, human genome had only been sequenced five years prior. Um, and then I believe it was 2017 was when the first FDA cell and gene therapy was approved. And that was three years after the last time we saw the Newborn Screen Saves Lives Act reauthorized. 
And the reason I highlight that is because in 2008, it was seen as a monumental step to bring standardization to this process at the federal level. And it was acknowledging the fact that the world around had changed and we needed to make those bigger changes um, and to not endorse one idea versus another. Um, I think there's a similar idea now where like there has a lot has changed around newborn screening, cell and gene therapy, innovation, sequencing innovation that we've talked about on this panel um, is changing how we view newborn screening and what is capable within newborn screening. And so not to get into the which would work best. Um, that's a lovely conversation for the working group. Um, but in terms of on the education side for the boot camp, I think it signifies that those conversations are needed and we need to, and not in the abstract, not in the wouldn't this be nice? It, in, in the, if we're going to do this, how's it going to get done? And is it option A versus option B versus option C? And so I, I know I'm talking around it a little bit, and that's partially because I don't want to get too far into the policy side of this today. Um, but I think it's, it's a great point to bring up and one that we agree is we should be having, we need to be having these types of conversations of not just should we do this, but if so, but yes, we should do this. So therefore, how should we go about it? And so that's really what the was at the core of the white paper. And I think, and I think it's a great point, uh, Matthew, because ACMG won't stop coming out with lists of, you know, variants and diseases and genes that you know, the evidence shows that it will make a difference in an individual or a family's life. So um, we'll keep publishing those. Um, what we're seeing in states adopting Duchenne newborn screening with it not being on the rust, like states aren't waiting either. Um, and this is all triggered by parents and advocacy groups, you know, being on those state, you know, rare disease advisory committees. Um, since the 1960s of PKU, you know, parents led the way about, you know, doing something about intellectual disabilities. I mean, um, if you look at, if you do kind of a landscape analysis, nobody's waiting for the rust, sort of. You know, it is there and we've learned a lot from it and I think we should continue to learn from it. Um, I think we can also, you know, sort of highlight the role that advocacy groups and the amount of time and money that they've put into nominations i've been part of some of them you know it's an incredible lift and was that intended when this was originally thought of you know i don't think so um you know when I, at least when i was on the committee um we couldn't you know predict the future but i think it's time to take a look at it um and on the sort of using the genome to diagnose provide timely diagnosis, provide the right care, provide lifelong management, and inform the families. Organizations like ACMG, AAP, ACOG, they're not going to stop sort of coming up with those guidelines as how are we going to implement them in newborn screening population-based sequence uh, screening. Um, I'm like, what did I want to say? I think I, <laughs> and it's like me and my I don't know, collaborative nature, I guess I want to say, I think part of the discussions that are supposed to happen tomorrow are meant to help pull some of this in. At least that's my hope. I can't say since it's not, I didn't plan those. Um, so I, that would be my guess. Um, but I, I think it's a really good opportunity to, um, I don't know, not necessarily move beyond, but kind of to showcase the beyond the idea that advocates want to add conditions to the panel that is like such a basic statement and i mean that in like a more of the negative it's so much more than that advocates want these systems to work well and to meet the promise that they are promising in lots of different ways, right? From the actual technology, to the implementation, to the time that all takes, to then really getting good quality outcomes and good quality data. And I think there's an opportunity to really highlight that by making sure that advocates are in all of these discussions, not just one or two particular lanes. And I think that's what the boot camp's about. 
um, in terms of that education, in terms of what are all those different lanes and what are all those, sorry, I'm gonna plug the next panel that'll talk <laughs> about that, um, in terms of all the different ways advocates show up in the newborn screening system and the opportunities that are there. Um, but I, I do think that being able to say, oh, we have thoughts too on that part of the newborn screening system. Um, there are thoughts about the matrix and there are thoughts about or even just questions about, you know, what did we used to do? Wow, we got to 29 and now we're at, you know, 37. What's next? Is this really the story? And to be able to ask those questions, those systems level questions, I think is really important to be able to highlight, I don't know, we're in this too at this level. Um, so, I don't know. I think also, I want to build up a point in, including them in a meaningful way, not just adding them to committees because they want to say that they have a patient advocate on the committee, including them so that they're being, their perspective is being heard and respected and listened to and included in the process. And Annie keeps waving at me, so I'm gonna. Well, I just, first of all, I just wanted to build on those comments, but I thought I'd ask a question because I think, um, so for so long, we, you know, we've always thought of the rust sort of the holy grail so getting a condition added to the federal panel and i think it's really interesting when we think about what we've seen for the last couple of conditions that and i'll just say you know for a very long time i worked for the muscular dystrophy association and um the chair of the board of the muscular dystrophy association had been the chair of the advisory committee and so you know he was a very firm believer that we definitely go for the federal nomination first before you go to the state and so our approach had been for duchenne for a very long time that we needed that data from the state pilots to go to the federal panel um, for the nomination for the federal panel and so that's duchenne has absolutely done that done all of the work to gather that evidence to move towards that nomination so had pilots in ohio and new york there were pilots outside the u.s that have not been brought forward to the nomination package and is now moving through that evidence review. Um, had a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of a bump getting to evidence review at first, but now is moving forward. But I think what's interesting juxtaposed to that, the most recent conditions that have been added to the federal panel have actually utilized statewide data from conditions that were added to the states first before going to the federal panel. And the committee, the advisory committee actually relied on that data. They really needed data from the states to inform their decision-making. And so I think it's really interesting as we think about this as an education boot camp, to think about as we think about communities sort of learning from one another, that takeaway is, do you really need to have some statewide data, not just pilot data, to think about what you need to move forward for evidence? And I don't know the answer to that. I'm just sort of thinking about most recent history. But as we think about going into tomorrow, and what we're going to learn and hear, but is some of that necessary? And so maybe one of the things I'd be interested in even hearing, because it was just referenced, Amy just referenced, that Duchenne now is doing a both and. So they're moving forward to the RUSP. But now they've taken that data and that package, which includes preference studies, surveillance data, lots of data, and they're moving into the states now too, with a lot of success. And so I would just maybe encourage some exchange in this room because you have a lot of experts in this room. You have the MLD community that's moving a nomination package forward. You have a lot of people that are doing a lot of data collection to maybe understand what everybody's collecting we have longitudinal data being collected. You have new data elements and registries being collected around newborns and how we're better understanding our patient communities. And what are we collecting from these families and how can we learn from one another so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and how are we doing it, whether it's at the state level or the federal level, so that we're standing on one another's shoulders as we move forward. So that would just be something I would encourage us all to be doing here today. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, one thing I want to add into that is um, years ago, we used to be uh, 
supported through HRSA to do, uh, I mean, didn't call it technical assistance, but I think it was just education and support to anyone who was thinking of nominating a condition. So I've had a lot of conversations with families and with groups who are doing this work. And, you know, I, whether it was the party line or not, I would always say you have to build relationships at the state level. You have to get that information because that is what, at the end of the day, the advisory committee is going to look at. And the more you do that, the better. Um, and that can sometimes seem not in line with sometimes some of the messages that we get, which is rust first. And I would always say to our federal partners, Russ first includes at least one state first, if not multiple states first. And I think there is now, again, that was a really long time ago. I think now there's a lot, there's much more appreciation for that. And so I really encourage if you are going this path of looking at um, potentially nominating a condition or just wanting to have a sense of what does it, what does newborn screening look like for the condition or conditions I'm interested in? Um, We've, we've come a good ways in terms of being able to reach out to partners, you know, at the Association of Public Health Laboratories, you know, we have federal partners here presenting this morning to really be able to build those relationships to ask those questions. It is not easy. I'm not trying to pretend like it's easy. I think sharing lessons learned, understanding what for real for real is happening is so critical. Um, but I do think we are, again, we keep talking about this particular time in history, we are at a time where I would say every uh, stakeholder group is like, something needs to change. Lots of things need to change. And I need to learn from the other people who are there. I've heard that more from all the different groups we speak to more than I have in the 17 years I've been in this, um, which I think is telling, but also is an opportunity. So again, I really encourage exactly what Annie is saying is to share your experiences, share your connections. Who did you talk to that actually, you know, really was at, was at a state who really had an in-depth conversation with you and, you know, share that information because I think People are really hungry for that in terms of what, how are we really going to do this in the future? Because it, is it really going to be the way we have been doing it? You know, I'd say every group has a question mark around that. And, oh, yeah, I'll just add real quick. Um, so I think in, you know, if you're doing a nomination, you always think, was there a state pilot check? Is CDC working on a QA, QC panel? Are they thinking about it? As Dr. Cuthbert said, she thinks five to 10 years down the line, they're often working on new molecular approaches or other things that then get built into those QC panels in the future. But one thing, you know, after the Genome Project, I was in industry for a decade. I used to do FDA submissions of molecular diagnostics. Boy, I could do analytical and clinical validity and you know, FDA studies very quickly in industry, high throughput. Why do we do two-year pilots? Why are we running the same test over and over and over and over? It's one in 5,000 to a pilot of 10,000. It's one in 10,000 to a pilot of 20,000. We'll learn more later from the state programs and CDC's implementation part of it, and we'll loop that back around. But for the pilot, we're just trying to prospectively identify one child so i think it's a great time matthew to even bring up these like we've got to look at the ways we're doing things and you know change them up if we can so i just want to flag we are closing in on lunch so we have two final questions and then we're gonna to have to break but andrea so mine is andrea matthews um children's sickle cell foundation um i just want to caution um a, a moment because um having served on the advisor committee I know the hard work that went into all of this, and we have a wonderful system that's working. So newborn screening is a successful program. Um, and I think that when we think about something needs to change and what needs to change, we need to think about um, building, evolving, and not necessarily throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So I just want a moment of caution just to think about how we can have it evolve and have, you know, have put our arms around these big topics and these things. Um, and as a family, as um, it's important, it's important to every family. So not just, um, you know, it's important that we have a basis and we remember in the historical context is very, very important to remember.
Thank you. So my question is, when you talk about the panel on a federal level, and it says that the states all do their own thing, when you're gathering that data on a federal level to pass any kind of laws or updates, how does that work? Because your numbers will be off. If they're not, if it's not across the board with every, like all 29 peop, um, diagnoses, how do you get that information accurately to pass it along? So in terms of collecting data from the states themselves? Exactly. So if only, you know, some states are just testing for sickle cell and then some right. test, states are just testing for PKU. When you're putting their numbers out, your data, how is that accurate if all states are not doing across the board when you're looking at research support services and things like that? To educate us because it's not across the board so do y'all just like estimate and put some more numbers in or because i've never seen something where it says you know uh 10 percent of the states test for this and this is what we get it seems as though until i got here today i thought everything across the board was the same so we do our best to track what the states each state is screening for uh and disease communities tend to be do their best at tracking prevalence numbers and those tend to change uh, as new word screening is implemented. So trying to match those two as best we can. Uh, new Steps is a great resource for collecting a lot of that data. The Eden Project, I imagine, is going to do a lot of great work there as well. Uh, but I'm going to turn to Amy because I know MBS Terran also does some good work yeah, there. Yeah, you know, I think it's hard because states are required to tell anybody, but they do. So they, you know, every state has their own website. It says what their panel is. But, you know, we often don't say, you know, what was the result? We screen for this, what was the result? What was the long-term follow-up? What was the health outcome? How do we compare across states? So I think some of that data, you know, is part of the new um, awards that Dr. Brosco talked about, the Propel and Excel. And so I think you can follow those on the HRSA MCHB website. I'm sure we can provide those links. And then CDC and Building Eden will give us more visibility into what are we finding? How many cases per year? There's the CDC's birth defect surveillance registry that looks at certain conditions. Not all the conditions that are part of newborn screening are part of that, but there's been some movement in that area because we want to know not only do we screen for it, but what happened? What was the diagnosis? What was the treatment? Our state's different. Our family's different. How do we help those families? So I think getting that basic data is going to be really important. I think every life with their um, new report on uh, timely diagnosis also points out that, you know, we really need to look at the patient's journey and each family's journey once they get that positive screen through diagnosis through treatment and care. So I think it's a great point and we have more work to do to get the accurate numbers. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that. I think this shows why education is so important and why opportunities for people to come together is so important. And this isn't just from an advocacy perspective, but we see this on the provider side too. When we do focus groups or when we have small education sessions with providers, at the end, there's always at least two people who says, I really thought I knew this and I don't. I mean, I, what I thought I knew is actually not exactly the case, whether that's about the consent or opt out process or whether it is, oh, I thought it was consistent across every state or, oh, I thought follow up was completely funded or it's, you know, a, a million different things, you know, oh, I thought, you know, all kids who have PKU, I mean, hello, we've been screening that forever. They're completely fine with treatment, right? That's covered by insurance, right? No, it isn't, right? So there are all those pieces that I think sometimes when you're in it all the time, it can be like, oh, we've talked about this, people know. But again, it really shows the importance for opportunities for, um, I think it was Annie who said earlier, you know, coalitions and coming together and sharing information and having actual discussion, not just present out, but actual discussion and why that's so, that is, you know, foundational in, I think, all work, but I think particularly in newborn screening. So um, it's a really great point you brought up. Thank you. I think, and I know you're going to close out, but I think in my sort of 20 <laughs> years, sorry, you know, sort of wearing that professional and parent hat, you know, working with Annie and, you know, just following, you know, her example and having these opportunities to think as parent and think as about it as a researcher and a professional has been wonderful for me, but parents have such power. We need to know what happens after that screen, after that diagnosis. What was your outcome and how did you make that journey and why were some kids more successful than other kids? And 
on the genetic side, you know, we're learning about these diseases. Once we start population-based screening, throw out everything you knew about those diseases. When my son was diagnosed as one in a million, it's one in 52,000 and one in 20,000 for T-cell lymphopenias. We can talk about that later if you're interested. But, you know, we are learning so much because of newborn screening. And I'm not sure we're always harvesting that information. Part of what you point out, I was thinking, oh, I know the prevalence of skid because I read these few papers. Who's going to know to read those papers? We have to put them somewhere. And our incidence does change. The phenotype changes. Symptoms change based on an early treatment. Um, so we just need to do more. Sorry, Kelly. No, that was great. <laughs> uh, I think that's a great way to close this out. So I want to thank our two wonderful panelists uh, and they're taking the time to be with us today. <laughs> and then a quick uh, few housekeeping, housekeeping items uh, before we break for lunch. Uh, first, as many of you are aware, uh, the original idea behind having the boot camp here today was to be able to help advocates attend the ACHDNC meeting in person. Uh, unfortunately, they had to move their in-person to a virtual option. Um, however, we are trying to our best to ensure the fact that we can still have that community aspect. And so tomorrow at our Rare Hub office uh, in downtown DC, we are hosting a viewing party uh, for all those who want to attend. Um, if you would like to attend, we do ask that you please let the registration table know so that we can get everybody's name and email address so we're aware. We also want to be able to, able to offer travel support to be able to get to and from the hotel. Um, and so please, if you would like to attend, we would love for you to be there, but please do let the registration table know. If you had checked yes on the poll and the email that went out, please let the registration table know. Again, just again, we want to make sure that our numbers are accurate for tomorrow. Uh, in addition, if you park in the garage here, the parking vouchers are available at the registration desk. Uh, in addition, if you receive a travel stipend, those stipends are available for you at the registration desk. Uh, and lastly, mo most importantly, uh, lunch is served uh, behind us right here in this room. So if you just go out the door you came in, make a left, make a left, and lunch is available. Uh, and we will reconvene at 2 p.m. Thank you guys so much.